Yesterday marked the third anniversary of the January 6th attack on the Capitol. And our CBS News polling shows that many Americans in each party are uneasy about the prospects of a peaceful transfer of power in future elections, with half the country expecting there will be violence from the side that loses. Our polling also shows that three in four Americans see the situation at the U.S.-Mexico border as either a crisis or a very serious situation. That 45 percent is a notable increase. Both of those issues, democracy and immigration, are dominating the campaign trail as we head into the last week before the first votes in the 2024 election are taken in Iowa. But first, we traveled to Eagle Pass, Texas last week and caught up with House Speaker Mike Johnson, who led a delegation of 64 Republican members of Congress to the Texas-Mexico border on a fact-finding tour. We have a humanitarian catastrophe here, and of course, huge national security concerns. What we saw is in, in some ways difficult to describe, just the magnitude of the chaos here, uh, the number of lives that are adversely affected, the um, you know minor children that are being trafficked into the country, and the fentanyl uh, mm -hmm. overdoses and poisoning that has uh, been a scourge on the country. And these are transnational, dangerous criminal mm -hmm. organizations. And the maddening thing about it is that the White House is allowing all this. These are policy choices that, that created this chaos. And it is thus policy choices that could change it. And Which that's what we're Which policy choices do you think well, need to be changed? Well, on his first day in office, President Biden came in and issued executive orders that began this chaos. Um, Remain in Mexico is, is one of them. Uh, the, the catch and release program has created part of this problem. You could end catch and release. But you need the logistical and financial support to be able to do that. Congress has the purse strings well, to give them the money to do that. That's true. But I'll, I'll quote to you the, the deputy chief of the U.S. Border Patrol. He said, it is as if we're trying to administer an open fire hydrant. Mm -hmm. He said, I don't need more buckets. I need for the I need the flow to be turned off. And the way you do that is with policy changes. We're just asking the White House to mm -hmm. apply common sense, and they, they seem to be completely uninterested in doing so. So we toured the Firefly facility, that tented facility. You all uh, went on the same tour. And what we were told is there, there is a need for consequences, uh, border patrol officials say. Sure. But they also need the money. They need the resources to be able to process. They said they didn't have enough men. They didn't have enough uh, logistical support to even deport people when they wanted to do that. So right. can you look them in the eye when you talk to them and say, I'm going to get you the money that you need? Because that is part of the challenge. We did look them in the eye, many of these. I mean, from the top officials to the rank and file. And they all say the same thing. Please stop the flow. Are you saying you wouldn't authorize new funding to help out those agents with what they say they need unless it is matched with these bigger policy changes? Right. The, the, I think anyone with common sense would tell you that you cannot throw more money at a bad system. We don't want to empower more of this. They, the White House, the administration, Secretary Mayorkas have put a welcome mat out. Did but you, know you couldn't that, even go through with the deportations that you would like to see happen without the funding to actually have the process function. I mean, well, ICE has the capacity to hold 40,000 beds. That's not nearly matching what you're describing. In a triage situation, you have to stop the flow first before you can uh, commence with the, uh, with the surgery. And okay. we, we're hemorrhaging here, and everyone knows it. These are very, very real and immediate issues. It they is are. a crisis. Absolutely. So don't you need the help of the Homeland Security Secretary instead of trying to impeach him. <laughs> We've been asking uh, Alexander, uh, Secretary Mayorkas since he took office to enforce the law, to do his job, and he's done exactly the opposite. He's but, testified un untruthfully but, but why before Congress But focus repeatedly. the congressional resources on going ahead with an impeachment when they could be dealing with the actual issues here on the ground? I, I believe Secretary Mayorkas is an abject failure, but it's not because of incompetence. I believe he has done this intentionally. I think these are intentional, policy decisions that he's made, and I think there must be accountability for that. Secretary You're going to impeach Mayorkas, the guy you need to negotiate with. Secretary Mayorkas is not a good faith negotiating partner. He is unwilling to enforce existing federal law. Why would we believe that he would do uh, any new provision? He's lied to Congress repeatedly. He's lied to me personally, About under what? oath. He s stood in front of my committee on multiple occasions and insisted that the border is closed and secure when everyone in America knows it's not true. So the senators who are negotiating with the White House right now have not shared 
the text of what they're putting together with you. Is that accurate? Right. right. So one of the uh, main Republican negotiators, Lindsey Graham, was with us on Sunday, and he said there were three things that would help get a deal to pass the House. Asylum reform, limitations on parole, and reinvoking expulsion authority. Those things are being negotiated. So what more do you need? Well, you've heard us say repeatedly, uh, insisting upon the provisions of H.R. 2, which is our legislation that we passed more than seven months ago. Provisions of H.R. 2 mm -hmm. include uh, reforming that broken parole system, reforming the broken asylum process. Uh, but also, it's, it's got no future in the Senate. Even Republican senators like James Lankford and Lindsey Graham say they don't want it. Biden's going to veto it. Well, so I, it's I, dead on arrival. I, I don't know if you can speak for all the senators. There's a lot who understand why those provisions are important. And the reason is, if you only reform one of those five provisions, if you don't end catch and release as a policy, if you don't reinstitute remain in Mexico, if you only fix asylum or parole and not these other things, then you don't solve the problem. You don't stem uh, the, the, the flow here. And again, that's the number one objective so that we can get a handle on this crisis. Do you believe that more border funding is needed? Because the White House says they want to hire more agents, they want to do all sorts of things, and, and you are standing in the way in the House. That's nonsense. It's absolute nonsense. They have to solve the crisis here, and throwing more money at the broken system will not do that. All it will. But you're not empower. opposing funding. That's what I'm trying to clarify. No, but we ha no we we understand that Border Patrol needs the necessary resources to do its job. But they can't do the job that they're hired to do unless you change the policy here. But you would potentially be open to what the Senate is negotiating and put it on the floor in the House? It's, it's a hypothetical question. Again, they've not sent me any of these provisions, but I've told them mm -hmm. what you we want expect. Deal. Of course we want to deal. Okay. We, we want to solve this crisis. We have to. We have a moral obligation to do so. Look, you at the end of this month are going to have a majority of just 218 Republicans. You need 218 to govern. Have you talked to the Democratic leader about what it would take to get a bill through? Have you talked to the White House? Uh, no, I, I, I mean, Hakeem Jeffries and I are, are colleagues and, and friends and have good relationship with him. Uh, I, I'm not uh, deterred by this at all. I'm, I, I'm undaunted by this. We deal with the numbers that we have. It will be one of the smallest majorities in uh, the history of the Congress, uh, clearly. It doesn't give you a lot of wiggle room. It, it doesn't, but uh, we do have, I think, a, a lot of unity on the big important issues that we're really focused on. And I, I'm, I'm confident that we'll get the job done and be able to, to demonstrate that we can govern well. And I think that's one of the reasons that we'll expand this majority in the next election cycle. I'm, I'm very optimistic about that. Well, first, got to keep the government open, January 19th. We, we do, and we've been negotiating in good faith all through the holidays, every day over the holidays, except for Christmas, um, on the, uh, the top line numbers. And mm -hmm. um, I, I think that we may be close to a deal, but we have insisted that federal spending must be addressed in a, in a very serious and sober manner. We, we crossed an important threshold this week, 30, th $34 trillion in federal debt. It's, there's never been anything of that magnitude in the history of the country, and it's not sustainable. The, the Congress has a responsibility. We have the power of the purse, of course, mm -hmm. and, and we have to be good stewards of precious taxpayer resources. We, we cannot continue to borrow money to spend it. And so reducing non-defense discretionary spending must be a priority of Congress, and we're trying to insist upon that in these negotiations. When President Trump says immigrants are poisoning the blood of our country, is that a statement you agree with? That, that's not language I would use, but, but I understand the urgency of President Trump's admonition. He's been saying this since he ran for president the first time, that we have to secure the border. And I think the vast majority of the American people understand the necessity of that, and I right. think they agree with his position. But that statement goes beyond what you are personally comfortable with. It, it's, it's not language I would use, but, but I understand... Um, Does that, it that sound hateful? From, well, it's, it's not hateful. What President Trump is, is trying to advance is his America first priority, and I think that makes sense to a lot of people. The, the, the current president, President Biden, wants additional supplemental spending on national security, but he denies the most important point of our own national security, and that is our own border. And so, but that you is can say that without him. talking about blood. It, it's and President purity. Biden's position is frustrating to us. It's frustrating to the American people, and certainly to President Trump. And I think that's what he's that's what he's articulating there. The White House declined our invitation to have Homeland Security Secretary Mayorkas join us today, but we will continue to ask for him. According to administration officials and sources familiar with the negotiations in the Senate, a deal to surge resources to the border and make significant policy changes is expected this week. Details are being finalized. 
Aid to Ukraine is being held up in Congress by Republicans who want to tie it to a border security package, including Johnson, who told us he believes Russia's Vladimir Putin must be defeated, but that the U.S. must, quote, secure the U.S. border before we secure anyone else's. We asked the speaker if the two aid packages could be passed by February. Speaker Johnson says President Zelensky personally told him that was the date by which he needs the U.S. funding. I think if the White House and the Senate are serious about this and they listen to the American people, remembering this is an 80 percent issue with the American people, they yeah. understand the necessity of what we're talking about. We have to insist upon securing our own country. And also if we get the necessary information and uh, the necessary answers with regard to what, what is the end game in Ukraine and how will be, we be responsible with the, the expenditure of those resources? The, the White House has not given us the necessary information. Have you spoken with President Biden recently or Donald Trump recently? Uh, yes, both. I mean, yes, I've spoken to President Trump very recently and uh, President Biden, uh, well, before the holidays. Yeah. Do you take counsel from the former president or what are uh, those conversations like? Well, very friendly. I mean, I've, I've known the president well. Um, I, I, I think I think he will be the nominee, and I think he's going to win the election and be the next president of the United States. So uh, it's important to maintain that relationship. It'll be an important one for the country. Back in uh, 2021, you were the lawmaker who circulated the, the legal brief known as the Texas Amicus Brief, mm -hmm. um, challenging the 2020 election outcome in a number of states, which by CBS editorial standards makes you an election denier. That's so, nonsense. Well, that's, can election. I get you on the record on that? I've like, always you, been consistent on the record. Did you read the brief? Did you get a chance to read what we filed with the Supreme Court? Well, I, I have read extensively some criticisms of you, that. You but, read commentary about the brief, but not what we submitted to the court. But right? you recognize that President Biden won the 2020 election. Can you the, just put President that aside President Biden as an was issue? certified as the winner of the election. He took the oath of office. He's been the president for three years. What I, the argument that we presented to the court, which is our only avenue to do so, was that the Constitution was clearly violated in the 2020 election. It's Article 2, Section 1, and anyone can Google it and read it for themselves. The, the system mm -hmm. by which you choose electors to elect the President of the United States uh, must be done by the individual states, and it, the system must be ratified by the state legislatures. That is language, plain so language out of the Constitution. So you still have issues Absolutely. with the validity of the 2020 election? The Constitution was violated in the run-up to the 2020 election. Not, not always in bad faith, but in, in the aftermath of COVID, many states changed their election laws in ways that violated that plain language. That's just a fact. Um, we presented that argument and that, that, um, those facts to the court, and, uh, and it was never directly addressed because of the Texas lit litigation, but that was the only uh, vehicle we had to present that issue squarely to the court. It was completely shut down uh, as, as an issue, but your colleague Liz Cheney, your former colleague, wrote Mike Johnson and our Republican leaders had played a destructive role. You, you, she says, convinced 125 other Republican members of Congress to sign on to an amicus brief that many never read that made numerous false factual and constitutional claims. H how do you respond to that and the impression that you might have contributed in some way? No, I, I don't January spend 6th. much time responding to Liz Cheney's criticism these days. Liz Cheney worked with the Democrats. Um, uh, on the Jan 6, uh, January 6th uh, uh, Select Committee uh, to, to make all of this even more politicized than it was. Um, she was a, a, a close friend and colleague before um, she, said she that made those choices. Yeah. You. I, I, you Which know, is why look, she was surprised, she said. Well, well, I'm surprised that she's giving that criticism because during that process, uh, Liz and I were in constant dialogue about that. And it, at one point, she even considered signing on to that bill. I'm, I'll, I'll tell you that that is a fact, um, uh, to that uh, amicus brief. Um, and we talked about that at great length, and we had a difference of opinion on the law, and, and, and people can agree to disagree on that. But I'm telling you that the plain language of the Constitution has never changed. And what happened in many states by changing the election laws without ratification by the state legislatures is a violation of the Constitution. That's a, that's a plain fact that no one can dispute. How do you make sense of the idea that you still have issues with the validity of the 2020 election, but you have to negotiate and talk with the president of the United States, Joe Biden. This is water under the bridge. I mean, when, when the Supreme Court uh, it passed on the Texas litigation and did not address the issue, I believe in the rule of law. This is our system. We move forward. I, 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 I work with President Biden as the president of the United States. I think that he will be a one-term president, but um, you know, this, 
discussion about what happened in 2020 is, uh, is yesterday's news. Well, I want to ask you, though, because a majority of House Republicans voted to authorize an impeachment inquiry into Joe Biden recently. What do you think he should be impeached for, and how do you negotiate with him in the process of that impeachment? The, the, the House or has... potential impeachment. Uh, uh, among the very uh, heavy responsibilities that the House of Representatives holds, next to the declaration of war, impeachment is probably the heaviest power that we have. In the previous ad administration, uh, we were very critical of the House Democrats because they politicized impeachment. That is not the way that we should handle that heavy power of the House. Um, we do have a responsibility, however, to investigate uh, things that are untoward, and this has happened with the Biden administration mm -hmm. very methodically, very carefully, in a way that is exactly the opposite of what the House Democrats did during the Trump administration. And now the investigation is being impeded. The White House has suddenly uh, refused to turn over documents that have been requested and certain witnesses that are key to unwinding exactly what happened. So it came to a certain point that the House had to uh, pass the impeachment inquiry as a measure because that puts us at the apex of our constitutional authority because we'll have to enforce these subpoenas in a court of law. That was a necessary step that we had to take. So again, we, it's still not been prejudged. We've not made a determination that impeachment is uh, going to happen here. So you haven't made the conclusion that you've seen evidence that we, we, you'll we, move forward with this? Well, no, we, you can't prejudge an impeachment inquiry or investigation. I think that would be a violation of our duty under the Constitution. You have to investigate and involve mm -hmm. the truth where it leads. There is a lot of smoke here, and mm -hmm. uh, Congress has a responsibility to find the fire if it exists, and that's what they're doing right now, if very, very carefully. Our full interview with Speaker Johnson is available on our YouTube channel.